Hello there everyone and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are starting Unit 3 of AP Psychology. In this video we'll be going over Unit 3, Topic 1, Principles of Sensation. Now when talking about our sensations and perceptions, we have to remember that our sensations are different from our perceptions. Sensation is raw data, information from our five senses. The source is our sensory receptors. While perception, on the other hand, is the process of interpreting the information that we obtain through the five senses. When we perceive different objects, sounds, and experience different situations, we utilize top-down processing and bottom-up processing. Top-down processing is high-level cognition. You're interpreting the information that is being presented to you. In order for you to understand this information, you have to use prior knowledge and past experiences. Bottom-up processing, on the other hand, is lower-level cognition. You don't need prior knowledge. You can use the information from your senses. Essentially, you're just organizing the information. We'll talk more about top-down and also bottom-up processing in our Unit 3 topic for video. Now, sensation and perception can be organized in a variety of ways. Some of the earliest forms of psychology, like Gestalt psychology, focus on perceptual organization, which is the organization of sensory data. Remember from our Unit 1, Topic 1 video, Gestalt psychology believes that the whole is greater than the individual parts. Gestalt principles believe that people will perceive objects in their simplest form, and that human beings will instinctively or naturally follow lines and curves. Gestalt psychology has six main principles. The first one is figure and ground, which is the tendency of our visual system to simplify information. What we see into figures, objects, and everything else gets put into the background or the ground. For example, take five seconds and look at these photos. What do you see? What comes to your mind first? If in this first picture you see the dog, then that is the figure, and the people are the background or the ground. If for the second picture you see the couple, then that is the figure, and the cat is the background. Or what about this example? Take another five seconds and let me know what you see. If you see the faces and the people, then that is the figure, and the rest is the background. Or maybe you just notice the pillars, making them the figure and the people the background. Gestalt psychologists discovered that our brain does this to help simplify what we are seeing and quickly identify important information. The next principle is continuation. This is the idea that when we are viewing something, we will continue to view the entire object and continue over to the next one as well. For example, when looking at the Amazon logo, notice how the arrow below load directs the eye to move from left to right. It also references that Amazon has everything from A to Z. Or we could look at an exit sign with an arrow pointing outwards. These are designed for someone to read them and then to continue moving in that direction. The next principle is closure. This is the idea that when something is incomplete, our mind will subconsciously fill in the missing information. For example, take five seconds and look at these images. What do you see? Did you see a panda, an airplane, USA, or a soccer ball? All of these images were incomplete, yet I bet when you were looking at them, you could clearly identify them. Your mind is filling in the gaps in the images. Up next is similarity. This is when the viewer will perceive objects that look the same as a group or a pattern. Notice how when you're looking at the NBC logo, it looks like one object, even though everything is separated. The shapes, the color, and the design elements of the logo are all similar, so our mind groups them as one. This also works when everything we are looking at is similar except for one thing. This is known as an anomaly. When objects are similar, another object can be made a focal point if it stands out from the rest. For example, when you're looking at these images, you probably notice right away the person who's jumping, the orange triangle, and the white circles with a purple ring. Those objects stand out from the rest and are emphasized. The next Gestalt principle is proximity. This happens when objects are placed close to other objects. The position of different objects that that are separated creates a relationship between the two objects. Objects placed in close proximity give an illusion of a singular object, while objects that are placed further away will appear as separate. For example, notice when looking at these images how all the lines are separate, but you see a deer because the lines are so close in proximity. You put them together to form one object. Or notice that the 2013 Coke advertisement, you see a smile made out of Coke bottles. They're all separate, but because of their close proximity, you see a smile. The last the last principle is symmetry. This is when objects that are symmetrical to each other are perceived to be as one 
object. For example, when viewing this ad for a bike expo, notice how you put the bike tire and the manhole cover together to create one circle. Or when looking at the Nintendo Switch logo, you put the two halves together to create the logo. We can also see proximity at work and similarities and also anomalies. Alright, so we've been spending some time looking at how Gestalt principles impact us every single day, but there's also more to our perceptions than just those six principles. One important topic is depth perception, which is the ability to perceive relative distance from an object in one's visual field. In order for us to be able to perceive distance or depth, we need to use binocular cues, which require two eyes, and also monocular cues, which only require one eye. Binocular cues happen because we have two eyes that perceive objects. When the object we are viewing is near us, our eyes will move inward, and when the object we are looking at is farther away, our eyes will straighten. This is known as convergence. Another aspect of binocular cues is retinal disparity. This is what allows us to have a degree of depth. It occurs because when we are looking at an object, each eye is seeing a different part of the object. The farther away objects are from us, the smaller the difference your eyes see. The closer the objects are, the greater the difference there is between what our eyes are seeing. Now, monocular cues are looking at how one of your eyes helps you see and perceive the world around you. There are six different cues that fall under monocular cues. The first is relative size, which is how we can see and determine how close an object is to us. For example, when looking at this picture, you know the cars in the picture should be roughly the same size. However, the cars that are closest to you appear to be larger. We can also see another monocular cue here, which is intro position. When looking again at this picture, we can see that the second car is in front of the third car, blocking part of the third car. So we know that the second car is closer to us than the third. Another cue that we can observe in this image is relative height. Objects that are higher appear to be farther away, and objects that are lower appear to be closer. The next monocular cue is shading and contour, or light and shadow, or relative brightness. This allows us to see the form of an object, which we can see when we're looking at the different shadows from the cars and the trees. This can also help with our depth perception. In areas that are hazy and have less details, they appear to be farther away. The next cue is texture and gradient. We can see that parts of an image or object that are clear and have more details appear closer than parts that lack detail appear to be blurry. If we go back to the picture, notice how the power lines and the trees in the back of the street start to almost come together, but the grass and the cars in the front can clearly be seen and have more detail. The last cue is linear perspective, which is when parallel lines appear to converge at a point in the distance. This allows us to understand depth and location. One other monocular cue I want to touch on is the motion parallax, also known as relative motion. This is when things that are closest to you appear to be moving quickly, while things that are off in the distance or farther away from you appear to be moving slowly. For example, think about a time when you're in the car and you're looking out the window and you notice that the cars right next to you appear like they're flying by, while the scenery in the distance appears to be moving slowly. This is the motion parallax at work. Much of our understanding of the information processing in the visual system comes from the research done by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, who were able to demonstrate that specialized cells in the brain respond to visual features of the environment. Okay, so we've been spending a lot of time with perception, but what about sensation? Starting with sensory transduction, which is when you take in an outside stimulus through one of your senses, which will then activate your sensory neurons, which ends up creating a sensation for you. Now, in order to actually experience a sensation, you need to hit your absolute threshold. This is what causes an action potential, a concept we talked about back in our Unit 2 Topic 4 video. The absolute threshold is the minimum amount of stimulation needed in order for you to experience a stimulus. When you're looking at if an individual will experience experience a sensation, we can look at the signal detection theory, which predicts if you will perceive a weak signal that is near a threshold level. To try and predict if you would notice a stimulus, we'd look at the strength of the signal and the different psychological factors, such as your personal experiences with the signal, your motivation, expectations, and your level of fatigue. All of these would factor in if you would notice the signal. For example, did you notice the flashing subscribe text that popped up throughout this entire video? Or was the signal strength just not strong enough and the stimuli just blended in with the background. Okay, quick side note before anyone worries about this video using subliminal messaging, which is when a stimulus is presented to an individual, but it's below their absolute threshold, so it's below their consciousness, know that it has been proven that subliminal messaging does not make you or anyone else do something that you would not wish to do. Going back to the signal detection theory, we can see that we can break it down in the following table. If when I mentioned the subscribe text popping up, you said yes, you noticed it, then we can see it was a hit. 
the signal was present and you were aware of it. If you were not aware of the subscribe text when it was shown, then it was a miss. The signal was present and you were not aware of it. Now, if there was never any subscribe text during this video, but you did not want to seem foolish, so you said you saw it, then it would be a false alarm. And if there was no subscribe text in the video and you said, no, you did not see any stimuli, then you would be correct rejection. Also, spoiler alert, there was never any subscribe text popping up throughout this video. Or was there? Now, sometimes we do not pick up on different stimuli because of sensory adaptation. Sensory adaptation is when we have a stimuli that is continuous. It doesn't change. As soon as the stimuli does change, you'll notice the stimuli. For example, if you light a candle in a room, at first you can smell it, but as the day turns into night, eventually you can no longer smell the candle. But if your friend comes over, they might notice it right away. This causes our sensory receptor cells to lose sensation. They might become less responsive to the stimuli. This is different from habituation, which is when you are repeating exposed to a stimulus and start to have a reduced response to that stimulus. For example, the first time a person does drugs, they might get a strong reaction from the drug, but if they continue to use the drug, they'll need to take more and more of the drug to feel the same effect that they had the first time they took the drug. With habituation, you're learning from a repeated stimulus, which then results in a decrease in your responsiveness to that stimulus. With sensory adaptation, you are getting used to an unchanging stimulus. Now, going back to our example with the candle that you lit in your room, sensory adaptation has occurred and you are now used to that smell in the room and no longer notice it. Let's say you leave your house. All of a sudden you smell new smells and this change in the smell causes you to notice the change. This can be measured in the difference threshold. This is the minimum change between two stimuli that causes an individual to detect the change. Essentially, it's just how much change needs to happen for you to notice the change. Now, in talking about the difference threshold, we also need to talk about Weber Fechner's law, which is the idea that for us to notice a difference between two stimuli, the two stimuli must differ by a constant percent, not a constant amount. This law was originally created by Ernest Weber, but was later modified by one of Weber's students, Gustav Fechner, who also became known as the father of psychophysics, a branch of psychology that looks at the relationship between physical stimuli and mental phenomena. For example, if you put one drop of water in an empty glass, you would be able to tell that there is one drop in that glass. But if I have a glass that's half full and you add one more drop, you will not be able to see the drop anymore. The change in the increments needs to stay the same in order for you to detect the change. By understanding our perceptions and our sensations, we can make sense of all the different information that we take in every single day. Now, we've covered a lot of information in this video already, so let's practice. Answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section below. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future topic review videos. And if you need some help in your AP Psychology class or you want to make sure you get a five on the national exam, check out my ultimate review packet. It has resources on every single topic of AP Psychology, and it'll definitely help you out. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, I'll see you online.